All right. So uh, up next, as far as your homework assignments go, um, homework eight is due on Thursday, the 4th. And so you can find the PDF for that online. Um, and today, the topics we're going to be discussing are the internal rate of return and the external rate of return. And there are a couple of different applications and a couple of different assumptions that distinguish when you would use internal or external. So uh, unless there are any questions, we'll go ahead and get right into it. All right, the first thing that I want to uh, illustrate is why interest rates are so important. Remember, the theme of this course is decision making. And uh, trying to uh, choose from among alternatives. And so in engineering practice, you'll often uh, face the situations where uh, you have to uh, choose between different types of equipment or to give the thumbs up or thumbs down on a project where it's going to be economically viable or not economically viable. So let's take the purchase of an automobile as an illustration. And there's a lot of different banks out there. And um, just as a comparison, if you go to Huntington Bank, <clears throat> at least this was uh, a couple of months ago, if you went to Huntington Bank and you were borrowing a car, uh, borrowing money for a car, then their annual percentage rate, which is the effective interest rate when you take compounding into effect, 4.72%. Uh, uh, in contrast, there is a credit union out there called Star USA Credit Union. And uh, their annual percentage rate for the same 66 month loan would be 2.75%. So it seems like that's pretty close. That's a pretty small difference in interest rate. But let's take a look at um, what effect that would have if you were thinking of buying an F-150 truck that has a net price of 54105 Well, First of all, I don't understand it when people spend more than $50,000 on a truck. I think that's absolutely nuts. But there are plenty of people who do. You see them all over the place, uh, these four-door trucks with leather, and they're jacked up and have a big engine and probably drink gra gla gas like crazy. But let's say it's for a business expense, and so it's potentially legitimate. Uh, the question is, if you're going to earn an additional $900 per month in new revenue, and that's after the cost of fuel and insurance and maintenance and so on, should you do it? So $900 a month is a lot of money. So one might just automatically assume, of course, if you're going to be able to add that much extra income, maybe it's going to allow you to get to more job sites or put an additional crew in the field, something like that. Is it worthwhile to spend, uh, spend 54109 if you're earning 900 a month in new revenue? And what we're going to do is we're going to compare that question according to the two different interest rates, 2.75 versus 4.72. Just to save time, I've set this up in Excel already. And the illustration that we're going to do, first of all, we're going to take all the amounts to the present. And so each month, we have some revenue amount of $900. That's the actual amount that we'll receive in that month. But what we need to do is discount that to year zero, to the present, uh, when we actually purchase the truck to see if the present value of all of these payments is more than what we paid for the truck. Because that's essentially what the truck is for, is we're going to be using it for business. And the comparison is comparing 2.75% versus 4.72. Now, first of all, since this is a monthly payment, $900 per month, we need to convert the interest rate per year into the interest rate per month. And so you can see that in this illustration, what I did for that was I um, divided the annual interest rate by 12 to get the monthly interest rate. And so if the annual interest rate is 4.72%, then the monthly interest rate is 0.39333%. We know that the initial cost of the equipment was 54105 and the monthly revenue we're going to receive is 900 And so in month zero, we have the outflow associated with purchasing the truck. So this is the minus because we're spending the money and then in each following month, we have the $900. And so you can see that by the end of this cash flow diagram, by the end of 66 months, what's 900 actual dollars in today's terms is only worth 695. 
And to refresh your memory how we do that, I use the PV function, where we started with an interest rate, and that interest rate that it's re uh, um, locked onto is the interest rate per month. So the monthly interest rate, and then here in the field for n, the number of periods, it will be which month we're on. And then I skip over the payment field, because what I want to do is I want to see the individual value of each one of these single monthly payments. And so I consider them as future values. And so this $900 future value, what is its present value when you discount it backwards in time 66 months? And so that payment is worth $695. The payment before it is worth more because it has been discounted fewer years to go from where it is back to time zero. Now here at the top, what I've done is I've added up all of the present values. And so what you can see is that if my annual interest rate is 4.72%, actually the uh, total present value is negative. And so that means that you shouldn't do it. That this would be a big thumbs down on the project because you're going to end up spending more than you'll have coming back to you. So the net, the net value of this business opportunity is negative. But interest rates matter. And so what if we go to this other bank, and instead of 4.72%, what if instead we have 0 0.0275 is the annual interest rate? So when I press Enter, it's going to calculate a new monthly interest rate. Of course, the equipment cost and the monthly revenue, that's going to stay the same. What will be different is the present values of those amounts. So let me ask you, before I have it calculate it, how are these present values going to change? Are they going to go up or are they going to go down? Which are they going to do, up or down? She's giving me the thumbs up. Uh, she's right. So why are the present values going to be larger if we have a smaller interest rate? Less discount. Yeah, because what we're saying is, we're saying that the, uh, the value of money is decreasing at a slower rate. You remember, inflation means the inflation of prices, not the inflation of value. So as prices inflate and the money supply inflates, that means that the value of each dollar in present terms goes down. So 2.75 instead of, instead of 4. Point, uh, whatever it was, 4.72. So now, if, if I just undo that, let's check uh, year 10. So year 10 was 8.65 when the interest rate was 4.72. But that year 10 goes from 8.65, now it's 8.80. So each of those future amounts is discounted less with a lower interest rate. So that means those amounts in the future are worth a lot more when you take it all to the present. And so now this business opportunity becomes a net positive. Not by a lot. You know, $963 for all the trouble of buying a new truck and putting it into service and so on. But of course, there are other factors in play. If, if it means uh, like employing some people who otherwise wouldn't have a job, then uh, if you could do that and at the same time make additional money, maybe you should go for it. OK, so that's just an illustration of how and why interest rates matter and how you can use interest rates to make a decision. Remember, this course is about decision making. And so if we were deciding whether to do it at 4.72, the answer would be no. But then if new fin financing can be arranged and uh, the rate drops to 2.75, then the decision making changes. And so this is an illustration of uh, making a decision with interest rates. And what you can only do with the internal rate of return is a yes versus no. And so let's talk about the internal rate of return. And the first illustration I have up here on the screen is as a, a balance. And I have that on there to help you remember what the internal rate of return is. The internal rate of return is an unknown interest rate that you solve for. And it is the interest rate that means all of the inflows and all of the outflows are in balance when they're taken to the same time frame. So if you discount everything to the present, or if you compound everything to the future, or if you take it on an annual worth basis, what it means is 
when you use the internal rate of return, the inflows and the outflows are equal. So that's just saying that in words. It's where the inflows and the outflows are equivalent when they're taken to the same time. Now, you can only calculate the internal rate of return if you've got a project that's generating positive revenues. Sometimes you may try and calculate it on a project where you've spent more than you've received back, and it'll just give you an error message, because the internal rate of return can only be positive. Uh, now, it's most easily solved using Excel, because this is an iterative process. You're going to be uh, guessing some interest rate and then checking to see if the inflows and the outflows are equal. And then you'll change your guess a little bit, and then you'll check to see if the inflows and the outflows are equal. There is a built-in Excel function as well that I'll show you that calculates it more directly. But before we do that, I want you to be able to solve it kind of manually, so to speak, using Excel. Now here's the analysis criteria. Remember I said that when you're working on a homework problem or doing an exam, you need to not only say what's the right answer, but you need to establish how did you make that decision. Like what was the, the decision criteria that told you whether something was a yes or a no. And when it comes to your internal rate of return, internal rate of return is often abbreviated I star. If it's above the MAR, meaning a minimum acceptable rate of return, then you accept the project and it moves forward, potentially. You know, this can be often used as an initial screening tool. Like before you would choose from among the alternatives, you'd need to see if they're acceptable. And a project where the internal rate of return is above the MAR is an acceptable project. But if it's less than the MAR, by definition, if the MAR is the minimum acceptable rate of return, and if your project has a rate of return less than that, then you need to reject the project. So the criteria are easy to understand. Um, a couple of other ways of looking at it, you remember that we did a uh, in-class exercise, I think it was just our last class period on Thursday of last week where we did the unrecovered investment balance. And that unrecovered investment balance was another way of looking at um, the balance between the inflows and the outflows. Because at the end of that illustration that we did in class, uh, the loan balance was down to zero because we had solved for you know, what is the repayment amount that in a certain number of years will make it in balance. Um, so internal rate of return, one way of thinking about it is it's the rate that's earned on the unrecovered balance of an investment that eventually is going to go into equilibrium. Uh, the book says another way of thinking of it is it's the rate paid on the yet unpaid balance of borrowed money. And again, from practical terms, what I'm going to emphasize to you is you can think of it as the interest rate that brings all of the cash inflows and outflows to equilibrium with the final amount. So they're equivalent. So if you were given a cash flow diagram like this, your process is you take everything to the present and then I star, the internal rate of return is the interest rate where the present worth of all of these cash flows is equal to zero. Now, in some cases, there may be more costs than revenues. And in a situation like that, it could be that there is no internal rate of return. So just keep that in mind, that if you get an error message when you've calculated the internal rate of return, add up the inflows and the outflows. And if there's more uh, outflows than inflows, then that could be the issue. So here's our method. What we're going to do is, again, solve for some unknown interest rate where the revenue and the expenses are equal when we take them to the present. Here's the formula for that. We're going to have revenues in year K. Year, uh, K is just some year through the entire cash flow diagram from zero to N. So we take the revenues to the present at some unknown interest rate that we have to guess and continue to iterate. And we do the same thing with the expenses we take them to the present, and each one of those expenses in the future will multiply by some factor, or we'll use Excel to uh, essentially convert it to the present. And then we add them up and look for zero. Um, graphically, this is what the internal rate of return looks like. Remember with the truck 
there was, when we checked the interest rate of 4.25%, that was the higher interest rate, the present worth of the project was negative. That's what we saw in the spreadsheet. But then when we had a lower interest rate, 2.75, the present worth was positive. So what that tells us is that the internal rate of return is somewhere between them. Like, think graphically. The low interest rate gave us too much money. The high interest rate gave us a negative amount of money. Internal rate of return is the one that would make the project just barely break even. So going back to this illustration, there's some interest rate that'll make this present value equal to 0. And that's the internal rate of return. So let's see, is it 0.03? OK, I'm getting closer. 0.035, I went too far. 0.034, I'm really close now. And then what's the uh, kind of smart, automated way to do this? Goal seek, yeah. So data, what if analysis, goal seek. So I want this to be equal to 0. And it should change the interest rate to make that happen. All right, so the internal rate of return on a project where I have $900 coming in and 54,105 is the first cost, the interest rate that puts those into equilibrium is 3.401% per year. So that would be the internal rate of return for a project that's paying me $900 a month for 66 months. So that's just an illustration. Graphically, we had one value that was negative, one value that was positive. Well, we could trace that curve by putting in lots of different interest rates. And what we'd see is there's some point that is associated with the zero present worth. And that is the internal rate of return that we're talking about. I have some warnings to share with you, though. Um, you can only use the internal rate of return in a limited way for decision making. Yes, you can use it to compare the IRR to the MAR to tell you whether a project is acceptable or unacceptable. But what you can't do, you should never do, is compare the internal rate of return for many different projects and then choose which project is best by which internal rate of, rate of return is the highest. As I'll illustrate uh, in a future class, that will give you the wrong answer if you choose the one that has the highest IRR. And I know that seems uh, counterintuitive, but the reason is, is that the alternatives cost different amounts. And so the one that has the highest IRR isn't necessarily the one that generates the highest profits. And what you want to do is maximize your profits, not maximize your IRR. So the take home message is, yes, use it for a, uh, an, uh, an acceptability check of the alternatives but you can't use it to decide which alternative is best. You'll need other ways of making that decision. Any questions about that rule? OK. One other, it's not a warning, but it's an assumption. And this is a big one. That's why I made it bold and I underlined it. I should have also made it italic. That would have really got the message across. But the internal rate of return assumes that the cash flow that's being generated by the business opportunity, it assumes that the money you get is being automatically uh, reinvested at an interest rate equal to the internal rate of return. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's not true. And so you have to be really careful about like, what kind of a project are you talking about and the profits, when they come in, what are you doing with it? So in the case of this, truck, when we calculate the internal rate of return for a project, what we're saying is the 900, 900, 900, 900, all that money that's coming in, you're putting it into an account that generates the internal rate of return. So that's true for like a bank account. Let's say if, if you have a savings account and the bank is giving you a monthly interest payment, they're more than happy to have you uh, leave that interest in the account. And so then the interest is earning the same rate that the principal was making. And so that's an illustration of reinvesting at the original rate. But there are some cases where you can't reinvest at the same exact rate that the cash flow was generated. 
We'll talk about that a little later. All right, so let's get started with this in-class exercise. I'm going to be giving you the handout here. We've got a cash flow diagram that I'd like you to analyze the same way that I did for the Ford truck. So what you'll do is you'll break down the cash flow diagram into a cash flow table. And then find the present worth of these two different interest rates. So the same way that I, I showed you just moments ago. And then do goal seek the same way that I just demonstrated to find the internal rate of return. And uh, my suggestion is to copy it to another uh, sheet. And so see, by copy what I mean is I've got this and if I wanted another one, but I, did, I wanted to preserve the original work, but I wanted to play around with things, I could just right click at the bottom where it says sheet one, move or copy, create a copy. And so then, like this one, I could do find IRR. I could play around with it, and then I'd have my original work from part one still preserved.
All right, so uh, let's talk through the solution here. We started off with a cash flow diagram like this. So there's some business opportunity out there where we pay 800000 in year zero. It gets us a stream of revenue for a couple of years. Then it looks like uh, we have to make a, uh, a refurbishment. And during that period, it's out of service. So we're not getting any revenue in the fourth year. But the revenue is back again in the fifth year. And it's even better than before. And then finally, in year eight, there's probably revenue and salvage value lumped together in that larger single amount. So what we want to do is find out how does interest rates affect whether this is an acceptable or an unacceptable business opportunity. So just playing around with it initially, what we do is we say at 7%. So if 7% is our minimum acceptable rate of return, and remember, one of the large factors that drives the MAR is how much it costs for you to borrow money. So if you can go to the bank and borrow money at 7%, then this is a good business opportunity. What it means is, if you were borrowing the money at 7%, you'd be getting this revenue to pay towards the loan, and then you'd still have some money left over. That's what it means when that's positive. It means that in the present value, the present value of the leftover profits after you paid off the loan, would be 26,906. So this can work at 7%. At 8%, it's not going to work. You'll have a negative present value of those future amounts. And the reason why is that you're discounting those future revenues uh, more rapidly. And so that means that those future revenues aren't worth as much. And so the practical implication is if you go to the bank and borrow money at 8%, then it means that your revenues aren't going to cover the cost of that loan. In fact, you'd have to take $15,000 out of your pocket to cover the loan, because the revenues aren't going to even just uh, pay for the interest expenses. So now, uh, in part two of the in-class exercise, I asked you to um, use goal seek to determine the unknown internal rate of return. So remember, the internal rate of return is we start off with, we know it's between 7 and 8%. Because 7 and 8% is that crossover point from a positive present value to a negative present value. And remember, graphically, here's what that crossover looked like. Uh, by the way, just as a quick tangent, remember on the exam I asked you to explain a figure? This is another one of those figures that maybe I'd say, explain this figure. And then you'd have to tell me the story of, like, what's the concept that's being illustrated here? So what we saw was a present value that was positive with a low interest rate and negative with a higher interest rate. And what we're looking for is that point of balance. Where is it where there's an equilibrium between the inflows and the outflows? So where is the sum of the present values equal to 0? And what I did was I initially played around with it manually to begin with, but then I got bored and used the uh, goal seek. And my goal was, goal is let the sum equal zero by changing the interest rate. And so 7.632% is the internal rate of return. So what that means is that if every time you got some revenue, if you were able to reinvest it into the same project, then let's say that you weren't borrowing money, that you had the money to begin with. So this initial outlay of cash in year zero, you were just spending that from the cash on hand. And you want to know, like, what's the equivalent interest rate? You know, instead of putting it in the bank, you did this. So what's the interest rate that you'd need to earn uh, to make it better to do this instead of just putting it in the bank. And so the equivalent interest rate of this, assuming all of the, uh, the conditions of IRR, the main one being it assumes that the money is reinvested at the same rate. So it's 7.63%. So if you could take $800,000 and put it into some uh, high-grade bond that pays 10%, don't bother. Go for the high-grade bond. It's a, a, a better investment and more secure. But if, like nowadays, you are looking for somewhere to put your money and the banks are paying like 
one or two percent and like good quality bonds are only paying three or four percent, then maybe uh, in seeking a better rate of return, this business opportunity would look pretty attractive because its internal rate of return is 7.63. So a quick question, why is it called internal rate of return? Internal. What's internal about it? You're on the right track. I don't think you've said it exactly right, but you're definitely on the right track. Anybody else want to take a stab? Why is it called internal rate of return? I'll just stand up here all day long. I got nowhere to go. All the money earned stays in. Good. It's, it's right there in the name. That number one uh, assumption is that the money that's generated is being reinvested in the project. So that gives you the reminder right there that the internal rate of return can really only be applied in situations where the revenue generated goes either back into the original project or back into a different project that's earning the same rate of return. So that's what internal rate of return, why it's called internal. Any questions about the first part of the, oh, actually, the IRR function. So question three uh, in this handout it was use the IRR function to find I star. So we went through this whole process. Let me show you how to use the IRR function. So uh, the IRR function. Okay, so that is, remember functions begin with an equals, equals IRR, and then as soon as you put the parentheses, it'll give you a, a hint, parentheses. It's looking for the values. And in brackets, that's something that's optional. So optionally, we could give it a guess so that it calculates it a little faster if it begins with a guess, but we don't have to. All you have to do is just highlight the amounts, the original amounts, not the converted amounts. So highlight the amounts, Close parentheses, enter. It says 8%, but if we have it display more digits, you'll see it's the same 6.33% that we went to all the trouble to calculate manually. So that IRR function, what it's doing is it's looking, you tell it a range of values, and it knows that at the top of the list, that's some amount that's at the present. And then the next number it sees, in its mind, it knows, oh, that's year one, then year two, year three. And within Excel, it's going to do the calculations of finding some interest rate that makes this entire range of cash flows come into equilibrium. So that's the IRR function. Again, let me demonstrate. It's one of the easy ones. Equals IRR, highlight the amounts. Don't highlight the present value of amounts. Highlight the original given amounts, and then return. Pretty slick. Who likes art? I sometimes go to museums when I'm in big cities, but I'm usually disappointed. Because I end up at like modern art museums where they have like a pile of paper clips on the floor, and you got to pretend like that means something, right? I like the art that, you know, the thing looks like the thing. I guess that's because I'm an engineer, right? But uh, here's a, a piece of art. This is Gauguin. Yeah, I remember that from middle school, which is the last time I took an art class. Uh, the name of this is, uh, this painting is called, When Will You Marry? I guess it's pretty nice. It seems, you know, there's some palm trees. Who doesn't like palm trees? Somebody liked it well enough that uh, they paid $300 million for that painting back in February 2015. So that's a pretty high price. It set a record at the time for the most that had ever been spent for a piece of art. I think it might have been exceeded since then, but uh, it's one of the recent really high amounts. But here's the crazy thing, is that uh, in 1893, when it was originally sold, um, it was sold for $750. And so if you compound that into today's dollars, it was 20000 And so, you know, 20000 bucks is a lot for a painting. Um, but it's nothing like $300 million. So why do I bring this up? Because remember, we were just talking about the internal rate of return. 
we wouldn't be able to calculate the internal rate of return for this investment. We couldn't. Um, so you may be thinking, well, why not? We could make a cash flow diagram. Like we could have the initial outlay in year zero was 20,000. And then we've got a lot of years. Uh, how many years is that? Uh, 127? Uh, no, no. Oh, boy. I'm so bad at math. 115 plus 7. When you're standing up in front of the class, your arithmetic abilities decreases a little bit. It's 122. So let's say, uh, so you're 122, and then it's a uh, inflow of 300 million. How come we can't calculate the internal rate of return for this? No, it's not negative. That's a good guess, though. Let, let's see if, if Excel would allow us to do the internal rate of return. Year, amount, okay, so year zero is uh, negative 20,000. And then we've got to go one, two, and we've got to go to 115, so this is going to be a long one. 17, oh, 122, all right, so 122. Okay, and so we need to put zeros in all of these because they didn't sell anything yet. So let's go all the way down here. And then it was $300 million. That's a lot of zeros. Let's just make sure that I typed it in right. That's one of the reasons why I prefer to have currency instead of general. With general, the commas aren't there. If you've got currency, then the commas help you to see that you did it right. So 300 million. Okay, so then I'm just going to do the IRR function. Okay, so IRR equals IRR, and then we have to have all of these amounts. Boy, it doesn't seem like that much when you calculate the IRR, but what I'm saying is, here's what I'm saying. This is not the IRR. Hmm. So why not? Exactly. It's not internal. What is the assumption of the internal rate of internal rate of return? Right. So the person sold this painting. They can't take their profits. They can't take the three hundred million dollars and put it back into the same painting because they just sold it to somebody else. And so the reason I bring it up is just this is like the perfect illustration of a situation where you can't calculate the internal rate of return because the profits have to go somewhere else. In this case, it can be reinvested in some other art, but that other piece of art that's being purchased, it's probably not going to appreciate the same amount over the same time period. And so it's just going to be a different situation. And so this is the most extreme example of that. But what it tells you is there has to be some other method for calculating rate of return when you can't reinvest into the same project. Because that's a pretty narrow scope. IRR can only be applied when you're putting the profits into the same project or into another project that earns exactly the same interest rate. And that's rare. It really only applies to financial instruments like bonds, CDs, savings accounts, and so on. Because those are the kinds of things that allow you to um, keep your earnings or keep your dividends in the same thing. Most businesses don't. So how are we going to get around the limitation of IRR? The way is that we're going to go beyond the IRR functionality and calculate what's called the external rate of return. That's often abbreviated ERR, external rate of return. And it's what you calculate when you're not able to reinvest the earnings back into the same project. So you're putting the money someplace else. So just as an illustration, what if you're buying a rare painting and then you're selling it? You have to buy something else with those profits. You can't put it, put it back into the same painting. OK, so here's what external rate of return is. It makes use of something called the external reinvestment interest rate. 
and that's abbreviated in our book I sub I. Other books abbreviate it with the uh, Greek character epsilon, and so um, if there are some notes that where I still use epsilon, I'll have to change that. Uh, in fact, some of your printouts may have epsilon, but either way, what it means is that there's an external reinvestment rate, and what that is is that's what the, the rate that you're earning on the profits that you're putting someplace else. So the, the guy who sold the painting, that person probably put that money into like uh, a bond or maybe into a stock that pays a dividend or maybe into a savings account. But wherever that money went, it's making interest. And so what is that external interest rate? That's what we're calling I sub I. So it's I sub I, again, is the interest rate that your cash flows that are being generated, it's the rate that those cash flows earn after they're generated. So it's where you're putting your profits. So here's the method. Uh, the method is a little complicated, and that's why on the back side of the page I've given you a template. And in fact, I've put a, a spreadsheet on MU Online that has this template file in it, just so you don't have to take the time to type it in so that we can dig right into the numbers and not fiddle around with just typing and formatting and so on. We'll get to that in a minute. But here's the method. What you need to do, first of all, is take all of the outflows, so that means the money that you're spending, you take those to the present and you're discounting them at I sub I, where I sub I is the interest rate that you're actually putting your profits. I sub I is usually given. It's not the unknown you're solving for. It's, it's told directly. It, you know, in a problem statement, I'll say you're doing some business and all of your profits go into a savings account that makes 5% or whatever. So you'll usually be given this external reinvestment rate. So you use it to discount the outflows to the present. Now the inflows get moved to the future. So the inflows are compounded to the end of the cash flow diagram, to year N. And so you again use that same external reinvestment rate, I sub I, to do that conversion. And then Step three, to solve for the external rate of return, you're having to solve for some unknown interest rate that brings the inflows and the outflows into equilibrium. And so the best way to do that is those amounts that you took to the future, the inflows that were compounded to the future using the external reinvestment rate, discount them to the present at some guess interest rate, and then play around with the guess until the inflows and the outflows are equal at the present. All right, so that's a complicated process. Uh, and so to help make it a little bit more clear, I've cr come up with this like visual representation of the steps. So watch this up on the screen. Don't look at your computer right now. Here on the screen, so we've got a cash flow diagram. And step one is move all of the outflows to the present. And you can see there's one big line pointing down at the present. That means that here we had multiple outflows. Take them all to year zero. And you use the external reinvestment rate to do that. Step two, take all of the inflows to the future. Again, making the conversion at the external reinvestment rate. So that's step one and step two. So you'll now have some cash flow diagram that looks like this. And now, uh, see this, where there was an inflow and an outflow in the same year? Take the net amount. So if it's a net positive, take it to the future. If it's a net negative, take it to the uh, year zero. But don't take the bottom part to your zero and the top part to the future. Because if you take both of them their separate ways, it'll give you the wrong answer. You have to find the net difference if both inflows and outflows occur in the same year. So that's an important word of warning. All right, then step three, you've got these amounts that are in the present. Take it to the, uh, I'm sorry, these are in the future. The inflows are in the future. Take it to the present, and we're going to be solving for some unknown interest rate. And so you play around with the interest rate until 
the amount of the inflows at the present and the amount of the outflows at the present are equal. So we just did something similar to that with the internal rate of return, you know, using goal seek to try and make something equal to a known number. So you'll do a goal seek and then the external rate of return is what makes those in equilibrium. So one of the things that makes this a little bit confusing, I think, is the fact that external reinvestment rate and external rate of return have some of the same words. They both say external and they both have the word rate. But don't let that fool you. You know, keep it separate. The external reinvestment rate is given. The external rate of return is unknown, and that's what we're solving for. So the external rate of return is the unknown interest rate that makes there be a balance between the inflows and the outflows when everything's taken to the present. Here's the formula that shows the same thing that I just talked about, but I guess that's probably the most confusing way to try and sort it out is with a formula. But just briefly, what you're doing is you're saying that the expenses and the revenues are equal, but you have to take the expenses to the present, so that's the outflows to the present. You take the revenues to the future, and you do both of those things at the rate I sub I. So I sub I is the given external reinvestment rate. And then what you're doing is you're solving for the unknown uh, external rate of return when you take all of these expenses, which have been moved to the present, uh, you take those expenses to equilibrium with the revenues by applying the F slash P factor. All right, so let's get some practice with this. Um, I told you that there is a, uh, <clears throat> a template file on MU Online. So if you go to MU Online and it's like the very bottom of the of the class page, you'll find it there. Be sure to save your file. All right, ICE 13 template file. Click on it. Hopefully, it'll give you the option to download. Open it up. All right. So you'll have that, and uh, here's the statement. We've got this net cash flow. And the reason why I'm emphasizing net is because, remember, if a revenue and a cost occur in the same year, you find the difference between the two. OK, so we have here our net cash flows. Uh, we can't do reinvestment. So we have to calculate the external rate of return. And all of these profits that get generated are going to be put into an account that yields 2.5%. So that means the external reinvestment rate is 2.5%. So we want to know what's the external rate of return for this project. Now, the template file, what I've done is I've outlined for you what the process should be. Um, we've got here a time column, years until year seven. Why did I give you that? What's the purpose of that secondary time axis? Exactly, good. So it's for calculating future values. Because remember, we're going to write down the, uh, the cash flow amount. You already have the, the nets, but put outflows into one column and inflows into another, just to make it more obvious what's going to go into this column versus this one. And once you do the conversions of PV of the outflows and FE of the inflows, sum them up all here, and we'll go to that point. I'll walk you through the last step for calculating the external rate of return. You're welcome to try it on your own, but let's at least fill out this table and then uh, see if we're all in the same spot.
there's this separate column for outflow and inflow. So for the outflow column, you don't have to put the negative sign for the, uh, for the outflows, because since we're calling it outflow, that's kind of already assuming that any amount that we put in this column is going to be below the cash flow diagram, uh, meaning that it's money that's going out from us. Anybody have questions with where things are at so far? Finding the sum of the uh, present value of the outflows and the sum of the future value of the inflows? So uh, don't look at your screen right now. Look at this screen. So most of you, I think, are at this point where you found the present value total and the future value total. The present value being the outflows, the future value being the inflows. Remember, the interest rate that you used for all this was the external reinvestment rate. That's the one where all the profits that are being generated are put somewhere else, and you know what that rate is. Um, so we're not going to play around with this. That's fixed. It's given. But we have to start with a guess of the external, reinvest, uh, the external rate of return. So maybe it's 1%. I'll just put in 1% to the begin. Um, now, what this says is find the present value of the sum of the compounded inflows. So here's that. Here's the sum of the compounded inflows. So let me just label it to make it unmistakable. Sum of the compounded inflows. So what this is saying is, Find the present value of this and use this guess value of the interest rate to do it. Some of you aren't watching. You'll be the ones that I'll have to show later. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this amount to the present using our guess value of the interest rate. And so this will tell us what that is. And what we're going to then do is we're going to keep playing with this until that amount equals this amount so that the discounted future values are equal to the, dis the discounted future values of the inflows is equal to the discounted values of the outflows. All right, so I took some guess, 1%. It's not 1%. We'll find out eventually what it is. But now I'm going to do equals PV of this single amount using this interest rate and the number of years. I mean, I have to look. It's seven years to get it from where it is right now, this 37,000 is in year seven. So I'm just going to type in seven years. And it's not a payment. It's a single amount that I want to move from the future to the present. So I'm going to skip over the payment field. And I'm going to make it the negative sign, because otherwise it would automatically flip the value and just click right there. So what is the present value of 37,000? Well, it's 34,000 is the present value if you've got 1%. Okay. So we want to keep playing around 0.02. We're getting closer. 0.03, even better. 0.04, this is getting boring. So now, this is when I say home uh, data, what if analysis, goal seek. And my goal is I will set this equal to 
25928.60 by changing the external rate of return. And it plays around for a little while, and then 5.22. So this is the final answer. So this is the external rate of return. It accounts for both the rate that the cash revenue is generated and also the amount of the external reinvestment rate. You can think of the external rate of return as kind of being a weighted average. It's taking into account not only how much cash is being generated by the project, but it also takes into account that money, once it's generated, where is it going? So it's taking into account how quickly the cash is being generated by the project itself and also the effect of compounding inside of that external account. So if you've got an ice cream truck and you're getting profits because kids love ice cream, but then you can't make your ice cream cream truck any better. You know, you've already bought the truck. So you're taking your profits and you're putting into a bank account. Your overall weighted rate of return takes into account not only the savings account, but it also takes into account the ice cream truck and the business effect of that. So the external rate of return in this case, what we were doing was we were you know, making some outlay, then we got revenue, then we had to pay a little more, then we got more revenue. So the external rate of return, taking into account how quickly the cash was being generated and the effect of its reinvestment, was 5.22%. Okay, I'm going to give you some homework points for your participation in today's in-class exercise. And so, please put your name on the paper and set it on this chair on your way out. I'll give the paper back to you on Tuesday. Uh, and of course, save your file. Do you have a question? Um, why don't you just write the external rate of return so that you've got it there and can come back and uh, double check your work later. So it's 5.22%. And if you didn't get this, uh, if, if you couldn't get that far, of course, you can continue working on it because you've got the file there. Save your work before you head out. But I'll give you the paper back on Thursday. And this is something you, you've got to practice. So let me emphasize this. There isn't enough practice in the homework to know it well before the exam. You have to do, like, do it over again. You let it soak in a couple of times because the method is, uh, is not that easy and you're not going to have the template on the exam. You'll have to start from a, a blank spreadsheet. So you have to know this well enough that you know the process is take the inflows to the future, take the outflows to the present, relate the two. You're going to have to kind of understand and know it well enough to do it independently without a given template. Okay, that's it for today. Please remember to hand your uh, in-class exercise paper onto the uh, chair, and I'll see you on Thursday.